I was really appreciating Sunday school this morning. Vince, thank you, brother. And you know, uh, she was talking about the feathers of a bird and how they're connected. I realized I had something in common with feathers. We both don't have bad hair days. (laughs) You said feathers don't have bad hair days. That's about the only thing I have in common with a feather. (laughs) If you're missing the Sunday school hour, please come. We're having a blessed time learning about creation and origins, grace origins. We're so thankful. But you know, uh, as we are here today, I want to thank you for all of you tuning in. Jim and Trish there at St. Vincent Hospital, we love you. Uh, The rest of you who are missing and traveling, we love you. And to those abroad in Europe and elsewhere, we're thankful you're tuning in with us. But you know, we've come a long way in this Win Jesus series. I'm already excited about the next series that we're going to be doing. But right now, here's where we're at. And I I'm excited about Jesus coming back. Are you? You know, this series is on the Olivet Discourse with inserts on eschatology topics along the way. Today, you may be thinking we're going back into Matthew 24, and I know I told you that, but we're going to wait one more week. Uh, Next week, we're going to get back into Matthew 24, but today will be another insert. The disciples, we have to remember, they asked Jesus this question in Matthew 24, 3. When will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? They wanted to know when the end was coming. When was he going to be coming back? And we've seen in our Lord's response that before his glorious appearing one day, times will get worse and worse birth pains leading up to full birth. They're not going to get better, not only for Israel, but for all the nations of the world. And we've seen that. The very worst of times will come in a seven-year period of horrific tribulation upon the world that will end this age of mankind's rebellion. After which Jesus will then return in glory to set up his kingdom here on earth called the millennium, which we are going to cover in upcoming weeks of this series. This seven years is coming because of man's refusal to accept the free gift of salvation and yield their life to the Son, Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, that lamb that was slain for us. And for the last three weeks, we have stopped in the Matthew 24 series to look at the Bible's teaching on this wonderful teaching that we believe is the rapture of the church and why we believe this rapture will take place before this horrific seven-year tribulation period. I hope and pray that you were enlightened and enjoyed these last three weeks showing why we believe what we believe. But this morning, before we return to the Olivet Discourse, I want to put another insert in. I want to address a question that has surely come up in your mind, maybe in this series, maybe before this series, but somewhere along the way, this question has come into your mind, which is the title of today's message. Are we close to the end? Has anyone ever thought about this? Have you ever asked that question? Have you ever pondered this question? Here is the message today. I could stop right here, maybe. The Mr. Obvious answer. We are closer by 2,000 plus years. There it is. 2,000 years closer to what? To the events that will end this age, that when Jesus at that time spoke those prophetic words to his disciples, and when the Apostle Paul wrote about the rapture, and the Apostle John wrote the book of Revelation describing the events of the tribulation, the end of the world, the future 
to come? We're 2,000 years plus closer, are we not? I mean, that's Mr. Obvious. But how close are we? Really, how close are we? Are there any valid, and I mean valid, clear indications? Not speculations, not theories, that previous generations have not seen, that the end of the age is in sight. Perhaps just on the horizon. Is there anything valid, anything clear, not speculative? I believe there are. And I want to share some of that with you today. Again, I'm not talking about speculations. I don't want to sit up here and talk about theories that grab headlines. We've seen them. Such as this recent headline reporting that, hey, the Euphrates River is drying up, so the way is now prepared for the armies of the east in Revelation 16, so we must be there because what's happening to the Euphrates. Or surely the increase of earthquakes and tsunamis and world natural disasters, we are near the end. Or the congressional hearing that just took place in July on UFOs, and now they're no longer called UFOs, they're called UAPs, Unidentified Anomalous Phenomena, which is preparing the world for the explanation of the rapture, so it must happen at any time. I'm not even talking about our social problems, the spiritual and moral depravity and decay, the free fall of truth and absolute truth and immorality in the world and in the church today, which the Bible says will characterize the last days. And we're told that in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and chapter 4. What I want to share with you this morning are some very clear, clear indications that we are close to the end. Clear indications that the stage is now being set like never before in history for the events described in the tribulation to actually take place. And should that cause us to ponder to think. Lord, I just thank you this morning for this time we could come together, to gather together as the saints, to worship you, to sing to you, to praise you, to proclaim you, to edify each other in the word and in encouragement. Lord, I know you're here with us right now. These words that we are speaking about come right from your mouth those many years ago. Lord, give us your wisdom and your discernment. But Lord, keep transforming our hearts to be like yours. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. So let's begin with some rules. Let's have some very clear rules, some clarification, some ground rules before we start. And I think you should apply these rules to yourself when it comes to eschatology at all times. For first, when we ask, are we close to the end, we're not talking about date setting. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 36, of that day and hour, no one knows. The church truly has suffered some severe embarrassment over the years and some ridicule rightfully so, over the years because of many failed prophets who have set dates that never happen. They never transpired for the Lord's return, despite the fact that he even said, no one knows. No one knows means no one knows. The only one who knows is God the Father, Matthew 24, 36. Anyone who gives you a date when the Lord is going to return immediately is a false prophet, okay? Second rule, when we ask, are we close to the end? We're not asking the question, are we close to the rapture? This is doctrinally and theologically very important. 
we are talking about valid indications or signs that we are close to the seven-year tribulation that will end this age, that will usher in the glorious and public return of Jesus to set up his kingdom at the end of the tribulation. That's what we're speaking about. You see, when it comes to the rapture, the Bible gives no signs. We must understand this. The Bible gives no signs. We're simply told to be looking for Jesus, who's coming at the rapture, could be at any time, which means that it is possibly as close as our very next breath. Amen? Hey, that's a real good flight program. We don't even need feathers for that, Vince. I know I don't have no air in my bones, but God's going to, I'm gone. Are you going with me? As we saw in the, the message kept from the hour, the church is never, not once, told to look for or prepare for the tribulation, nor is it ever told to look for the Antichrist. Third rule, though we cannot and must not set dates, we ought to understand the climate of the times. Jesus said this, follow me here, in Matthew 16, one through two. He said, Here we are in verse 1. The Pharisees and Sadducees came up, and testing Jesus, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. But he replied to them, When it is evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. What's he talking about this verse for? Follow me here, just for a minute. In this context here, as you read the passage, Jesus is condemning the Pharisees because they asked for a sign. He tells them that they were careful observers of weather signs. They could look at the climate of their day and for the most part, forecast if fair weather was coming or stormy weather was coming or threatening storms were on the horizon. This is that old adage that we get, what? Red sky at night, sailors delight. Red sky in the morning, sailors take warning. Yet the Lord is telling them here in this context when they were surrounded by the many signs, when they were surrounded by the miracles, the signs and wonders that Jesus had worked which all pointed to him through the Old Testament, pointed to him as their prophesied Messiah, they could not read or discern those signs. If they had read the signs as easily as they had read the weather, they would have realized, they would have understood that they were living in momentous times. Namely, hey, the Messiah is among us. And by way of application there, I believe that we, as we look at the climate of our day, it is clear that we are living in momentous times. You could use the analogy and say, the skies, so to speak, indicate that the storm of God's judgment is gathering on the horizon. Even a small amount of discernment ought to be able to see that the stage is now being set like never before in history for the events described in the Word of God of the tribulation that is actually going to take place. The fourth rule, and this one we tend to see a lot of failure in. When we ask, are we close to the end, it must not be an Americanized answer. This happens all the time. And in our arrogance about the United States, we think sometimes and believe that all of eschatology hinges on what the United States does. Look how America has fallen from its mostly Christian foundation. How true. Look at the moral free fall since the 1950s. Look at America. Jesus is coming soon. And that could be very true. You, we can look at the United States, but not alone. As if somehow God's timetable is linked to an American timetable. 
So we must remember this. We would always do good to remember this, that the coming tribulation is a worldwide event, as is the glorious return of Jesus Christ. It's worldwide. So with those clarifications and those ground rules out of the way, let's look at the first indication that we are close to the end. I'm going to give you a few today that I believe are fundamentally and biblically solid. The first is the rebirth of Israel. I'm not going to spend much time on this as we have already. We looked at this before in the message Gentile Times. If you want to know what the Gentile Times are, go back if you missed the series and listen to that message. We saw that that is in our lifetime and in your lifetime you have seen a miracle of God in that Israel, a nation, thought dead, thought gone for thousands of years, has now come back into existence in her land as a self-governing nation starting in May of 1948. Monumental. This is a clear indication. And we know that this nation is so significant we know from the book of Revelation that the Jews will be a nation to whom the Antichrist will make a covenant, as we saw in Daniel. And they will have a temple in Jerusalem in which the Antichrist will enter and declare that he is God. We saw the abomination of desolation. And to this day, we are, have so much evidence, even the government admits, they are ready and preparing to rebuild the temple. It is the lifeblood of their faith. But it is not the rebirth of Israel alone by itself that is overwhelmingly significant. It is the rebirth of Israel in connection with two other things that we're going to look at this morning that brings us even closer to the conditions of the coming tribulation. However, keep in mind, everyone, that this rebirth of the nation of Israel today is in accordance with the prophecy of Ezekiel 37, the gathering of dry bones. It's a political regathering, not a spiritual. God's people Israel, they have still not come to life through the Holy Spirit. They still do not recognize Jesus as their Messiah. That regeneration, that remnant we saw of Israel will come at the end of the tribulation when Jesus returns and they in repentance will they look upon them whom they have pierced, Zechariah 12, 10. Our second indication that we are close to the end, what could it be? It is the rise of globalization. The rise of globalization. Globalization is a term that only began to be used Commonly, in the early 1990s, after 1990 into 1991, at the fall of the Berlin Wall, and I was there in the military, the fall of the Eastern Bloc nations and the opening of markets, globalization became a new phenomenon. To anyone born after 1991, you know of no other time than a time of globalization. You have nothing to compare life to other than being involved in a life of globalization. It is a term used to describe how to trade and technology, uh, how to trade and the technology that have made the world into a more connected and interdependent place. Globalization also captures with it in the scope the economic and the social challenges that have come about as a result. The rise of globalization is political and economic. Politically, what do we know from the Word of God? We know from Daniel 7 and Revelation chapter 17 that during the tribulation, the whole world will be divided amongst ten kings. Each king representing the Bible uses the word kingdom. And these ten kingdoms will give their power and they will give all authority to the beast. That is the Antichrist in Revelation 17, 12 through 13, resulting 
in no other than a one world government under his dictatorship. You see, the idea of a world global government was simply inconceivable in generations past. Yet in our lifetime, we are seeing politically and economically the stage being set for this, just as the Bible predicts. Everyone here is in a season where you have been, I mean, where you have seen the start and the continuation of globalization or You were born into it and know nothing else. We are in a monumental shift in the history of the world, especially in how governments and nations exist with one another. For example, how many of you have heard of the Club of Rome that began in 1968 and is extremely strong today, a political think tank that has major influence into the political sector? They're a global think tank with a large social and a large economic political influence in our governments today. Their goal, quote, to divide the world into 10 economic political regions called, get this, kingdoms, which would unite the entire world under a common leadership and common monetary system, end quote. We are seeing through our gross domestic product and national uh, gross domestic products and international trade that trade now is at the highest level connectivity and globalization the world has ever seen up to 60% of GDP. There are powerful forces, my friend, working today to bring this new world order into existence. Sometimes you will hear it under other key phrases like the Great Reset. You can go read all about the Great Reset, especially with uh, government's involvement in thegreatreset.org, whose goal is to control all human beings in the world. Now, this political globalization is also an economic globalization. There was a time, think about it, when Daniel Boone and good old David Crockett traded their furs with the Indians only as far as they could paddle down the river. But then came the steamboat. Then came the railroad, the telegraph, the car, the airplane, computers, and technology, enabling increasing economic cooperation with a far distant countries and globalization is underway. Like no Nothing we've ever seen before. Our markets are hinged on the global market. Our markets and everything are traded under a monetary system. To have a global economy, everything has to be standardized, which is the push behind a cashless society, which is the push of digital currency. A one-world global currency, a one-world economy for a one-world government. We are moving ever so swiftly to a cashless society. If you have not heard of this, you certainly need to be aware of this. And that is the rise of CBDCs, central bank digital currencies, which is a virtual currency issued by a central bank. And when you look at political and government research, many are researching this and using this. According to Cointelegraph, in the future of money, it says this, digital currencies issued by central banks are currently one of the most revolutionary innovations in the global financial ecosystem. Ideally, all companies within a country would exist in the central bank's network, which the government would have control of the entire network so there would be no more need of local banks. When's the last time you've ever received a paper paycheck? (laughs) According to the Atlantic Council, 130 countries representing 98% of global GDP are exploring the use of CBDCs. This is up from 35 countries just in 2020. As they put it, there is no 
stopping this digital train. They went on to say, a CBDC would certainly provide government with more control over citizens' funds. Citizens who want less government involvement over their financial lives see a huge problem with this type of currency. Thus, start reading the headlines like these, CBS News, Sweden, Sweden moving towards cashless economy. The Washington Tribune had this headline, Congress preparing for a cashless society. MSN News had this uh, recent article, virtual wallets power speedy payments. I mean, how many times have you Apple paid somebody? How many times have you Venmoed somebody? I mean, virtual wallets, just ding, and you pay for stuff right at a cash register. Before we comment on the significance, the significance of this one world economy as it relates to the world conditions and the tribulation, let's look at something else. The third indication that we are close to the end, you have Israel, you have globalization, it's the expansion of ID technology. Are you guys following along with this new phenomena? Along with this global digital economy, comes the need for personal security. And when you have personal security needed, there's great measures that take place so people can't get into your business, so they can't get into your bank, and thus the rise of modern biometrics. Biometrics is everywhere, everywhere. No need for signatures, no need for passwords. Boom. Open right up. Biometric recognizes you based upon your very unique biological characteristics. Biometrics is behind thumbprint, face, eye retina, and chip recognition. It can even read your personal blood veins to identify you. It is being used for civilian identity in populations throughout the world today. It's called population registration. You wanna hear something amazing? How many here have heard of India's Adhar project? No? This is huge. This is massive. This has been around for 10 years now. Nations around the world are watching looking and learning and wanting to incorporate a similar system. It is the world's most extensive biometric identification system. The ADHAR number is a 12-digit unique biometric identity number issued to all of India's residents. 1.3 billion people out of India's 1.42 billion people as of January 2023 have a biometric ID number given by their unique iris and fingerprint recognition. Didn't know that about all of India. Didn't know the United States is looking into that. Didn't know that the European Union is looking into that. This is 99% of India's, India's adult population. From Times on the World News in India, quote, while it started out voluntarily. While supposedly voluntary, Adhar had imposed itself increasingly onto citizens' private lives. It became near impossible in India to buy a cell phone, contract, or open a bank account, for example, without providing your Adhar number, your biometric number. Though voluntary, businesses came in line. And in, in the India Supreme Court, filed in the India Supreme Court, it said, without biometric identification, you couldn't rent a house, you couldn't get a bank account, you could hardly live any aspect of life. We assume, naturally, that we should all get to live. You see, this is well on its way to the entire world. Amazon. They have a new uh, documentary out on Am uh, uh, Am called the Amazon Empire. You want to know about data. <laughs> Quote from one of their executives. You can get on and watch it. 
quote right from Amazon. Whoever owns, collects data, if you have the access and rights to data, then you are king. It's all about the data. It's everything. This is well on its way. But here is the major debate of the day. It's being debated in the House of Congress. It is being debated all over the world. It is being debated in the business sector. It's this. Who owns the data on everyone? Who owns all this data? You see, in the wrong hands, the control of that data could lock anyone out of everything necessary to sustain life. Right now, with biometrics, every one of you and whoever owns the data could completely shut your life down. We exist in those days today. Revelation 13, 17 tells us that under the one world government of the Antichrist during the tribulation, this, no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. And don't kid yourself, with globalization, with ID biometric technology, with AI technology, everything is in place to shut your life completely down, seize your bank accounts, close down every access you have to buy, barter, sell, or trade. Never has this been in history. My only point is to show that technology is now here in our lifetime that can be used to identify everybody on the face of the earth in order that they might participate or not in the economy of that day. So with the rebirth of Israel, <clears throat> rising globalization politically and economically, as well as the expansion of ID technology, biometrics, everything, everything, and when you look at all the end time prophecies, everything is now in place to fulfill the conditions that will exist in the tribulation. Did you know that? Something that could not be said just 50 years ago. But what has all of this to do with us if we believe the rapture will occur before the tribulation? I mean, so what? I mean, well, since we know that the rapture will precede the tribulation, right? And our Lord's manif manifestation in glory by at least seven years, the period of the tribulation, then when we see these three things taking place, do we not know the rapture is automatically closer by reason, especially when you add in the world and the way the Bible defines the world we'll be living when we lead up into the tribulation. What's a good example? What's an example we could use? For example, hey, when you see Christmas decorations going on sale, when you hear Christmas carols being sung, no duh, you know Christmas is coming, right? Crazy, but some stores already have their Christmas decor coming out. It's like, what? What? And if you know that Thanksgiving precedes Christmas, then as the signs of the approaching Christmas gather and the signs of the approaching Christmas intensify, you know, Thanksgiving's coming. It's near. Well, so what? Did you know in 1 Chronicles 12, 32, about the 12 tribes of Israel, the sons of Ishakar were praised because they understood the times with knowledge of what Israel should do. If our understanding of the times is that the end of the age is near, should we then not know what we should do? To understand the times with knowledge is a praiseworthy thing. Therefore, we have to ask ourselves, should we live differently? Should we be living differently? But let me ask you this, should we live differently because we believe his coming is imminent? 
I mean, should we just live differently because we believe His coming is imminent? Okay. In one sense, yes, but in the other sense, definitely not. Robert Munz, in criticizing those who try to use the signs of the times to bring Christians into line, said this. The wife who just tidies up her house for the visitor, yet for the most part never cleans, would not be considered a good housekeeper just because she got it together before the visitors came over. Or the husband who only plays with and spends quality time with his children and quality time with his wife when the in-laws or his parents come around would not be considered a good, loving family man just because he got it together when they came. Would we agree with that? Our motives ought to run much deeper and much purer than just get it together because Jesus is coming. Surely we would not determine how we should live, right? Surely we wouldn't determine how we should live based on the nearness or the farness of the coming of the Lord. Is that, is that the barometer? I mean, even if the blessed hope were 1,000 years still away, it should not diminish our faithfulness. It should not diminish our dedication or our service to Him, should it? But yet, if His coming is very near, as the signs we have looked at might indicate, should we not, because of that, buy up every opportunity that is ours while there is still time? Should we not truly be redeeming the time? And if we really believe that Jesus could come for us at any time, we must ask ourselves the question, should that not be reflected in the way we live? Robert Murray McShane, a man of God who died at just 29 years of age, on one occasion he went to his board members and he asked them this. He said, men, I have a question to ask you and I want an honest answer. Do you think Jesus will come tonight? And after thinking about it, one by one, his board members answered, in all honesty, no, we don't. Then they asked him, what do you think? What do you think, really? McShane then opened his Bible to the Olivet Discourse of Matthew 24, our text for the Win Jesus series, and he took them to verse 44. You must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think He will. And that was His answer to the board. I had to ask myself these questions. How many actually think Jesus is coming today? I'm not asking for a show of hands. How many of you think Jesus is coming? You see, later on in the parables, and we're going to be looking at the parables and, uh, coming up, We will see in the upcoming weeks that there is a kind of servant that Jesus calls evil who says in his heart, my master is not coming for a long time. Matthew 24, 48. The best thing that I've learned that we could ever do with God is just to be honest with him. He already knows the truth, even if we're failing. Let's be careful that we do not have an attitude today that says in the heart, well, it's been 2,000 years, therefore he will not be back for a long time. Well, society has always been this sinful. Society has always been like this. Jonathan Edwards, who died in 1758, who is probably one most known for his sermon, what? Sinners in the hand of an angry God. He wrote down, now granted, remember, he's just a sinner saved by grace like us. So I'm sure he wasn't perfect at all these resolutions. But here's his heart. He wrote down 70 resolutions that by the grace of God he was determined to live by. Here was resolution 19. 
He resolved never to do anything which I should be afraid to do if I expected it would be above an hour before I should hear the last trump. Man, I've not done such good, so, so perfectly at that resolution. You remember what I said at the beginning of the message? I referred to 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. That famous, those famous verses of Paul to Timothy describing what will characterize not only the world, but will characterize the church in the last days. Let's read it. But realize this, that in the last days difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Avoid such men as these. Let me ask you, does this look like a people who believe that the Lord could come at any time? That last day's church, does that look like a group of people who think Jesus is coming? Do they, are they living their life as if Jesus could come in the next hour? Let's not let any of that be what we practice. We may fail day to day in our walk and need the Lord's forgiveness for sure. But what are we practicing? What is guiding our heart? What is our vision? Do we have this eternal vision? Last week I challenged us in light of the shortness of time to be witnesses, remember? To be those witnesses that trust God to help in our weaknesses and in our feebleness. To share and proclaim Jesus to a lost and dying world, world. I challenge us to that outward action to love God and to love people. Sharing Jesus and loving others. But this week I want to do a different challenge. I want to challenge us to look inside the personal level. To the personal level to resolve like John, Jonathan Edwards to live as if we expected his coming to be no more than an hour away. If we really believed, really believed, would you live differently if he was only an hour away? I know we all are going to say sure. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us? That we would be called children of God <laughs> uh, know your identity. And such we are, right? For this reason the world does not know us because it did not know him. As we saw last week, how great a love that we are actually children of God. And the world does not know us. They don't understand us. We are peculiar because we are born again. We have the Holy Spirit living in us. We don't look like the world, act like the world, talk like the world. Because they don't know him, yet we proclaim this great love and have the wonderful privilege to introduce them to our Lord. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we <laughs> will be like him, because we will see him just as he is. When he comes for us, we saw this, we're going to be changed. But we're not just going to be changed. Should he come within the next hour, we will be like him. Wow, what type of hope is that? That is a certain, perfect, beautiful, guaranteed hope. What a glorious transformation that will be, right on? Why, yes, why should we be discouraged and allow depression to run and rule and reign our life? Why do we live in habitual discouragement? Why are we walking around and living in sins? Why are we counseling the falling apart of marriage after marriage after marriage? Why are children falling away? Why? 
Why are we troubled so badly in our trials when we know, when we know at any moment Jesus could come that we will be changed, that we will be like Him, that we will see Him. Oh yes, it's because we are so mired down in this world. We are so finite, we can barely understand or grasp what that is. As the world invades us and beats down on us and this battle we're in. When we know that at any moment the Lord could come, when we know that we are children of God, well, this is what it says. And everyone who has this hope fixed on Him, there's the key, fixed on Him, purifies Himself just as He is pure. There is a response to these verses. We must purify ourselves. We must be involved in the sanctification process. Compare that this with the last day's church described in Timothy. These people, they are not looking for Christ. These people, it says they are loving themselves, not loving God. They are actively contaminating themselves rather than purifying themselves. And they are contaminating themselves in their thoughts. They are contaminating themselves in the windows of their life, their eyes. They are contaminating themselves in their heart and the desires and the passions of their lust and their flesh and their actions. And their hope is not fixed on Jesus. Their hope is fixed on this world. If we can see if we can remember, if we experience His great love and we want to please Him as His children, verse 1, and we know we will be changed at His return and be like Him, verse 2, then let me encourage you this week, stay fixed on Him and purify yourself in your daily lives. Lay every aspect of your life at the feet of Jesus Christ. Lay it at the Holy Spirit and say, clean me, whatever I, oh Lord, create in me a clean heart. God will meet you where you are. God will forgive you from where you've been. God will take you to where you've never been. And He will continue to be faithful to sanctify you and transform you and purify you. But you must be willing. Are you a child of God? Are your eyes fixed on Him? And then, you will then live in such a way that you will not be ashamed of what you're doing in any hour of the day. If the Lord came within that hour, you will not have any regrets in what you have done or what you have not done. Is there someone you need to get right with in life? A spouse, a coworker, a friend? Are there sins that you are nursing, that you are tolerating, things you are doing, things you are watching, that should He come within the hour, you would be so ashamed? Let me ask you as McShane asked his board, E.C. Grace, do you think Jesus will come today? Do you believe we are close to the end? If we say we believe it, then let's resolve in our hearts and in our minds with the power of the Holy Spirit and to pray for one another to then live like it. Let's live each day as if it might be our last day. Let's do it. Our last day before the Lord takes us out of this world. Because I know, I know this, and I don't need a lot of discernment for it. There is coming a day in my life where it will be the last day. Whether He calls me home through the way of the earth or calls me home in rapture. I just do not know what that day is or when it will be. So I must live like it today. Take my life 
my hands, my voice, my silver, my will, my love, and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my feet, my lips, my intellect, my heart, myself, and I will be ever only all for Thee. Ever only all for Thee. O oh Lord, take all my moments and all my days and let them flow in ceaseless praise. Can we live like that? Can we at least ask God to give us the hearts to be like that? Amen? Let's stand and sing.